This video is brought to you by patreon.com slash worst take. Get access to exclusive live streams and discord servers, on screen shout outs and early access to some videos when you join now. Help make sure that we can continue to make content like this by supporting the Patreon. Links are in the description down below. All right, so Jameis Winston likely going to be the starter, presumably for the rest of the year. We'll see if they want to put DTR back in here. I guess you could talk a little bit about DTR because you're out there on the West Coast too, so you're like you're able to watch those games yeah. um, at an acceptable time frame. Because <laughs> yeah. I, I was talking about this with somebody with DTR. I'm like, it was it's so interesting these Pac-12 guys when they play in the SEC, like how much the perception of them changes. It's just because people know who they're playing, are familiar who they're playing against, and like are actually watching those games. Like Jada Daniels, I believe he was a uh, Arizona State guy, right? Yep. And then goes to LSU. All of a sudden, he's the second overall pick, rookie sensation. And like, I wonder. I'm like, what happens if he just never leaves Arizona State? Like, does he become the second overall pick? Because I don't think that's the case there. Um, and it's always been a fascinating thing because I went back to watch some of DTR stuff in college and like his highlight reel is amazing from his last year in college. And you watch him, you're like, oh my God, like who is this dude? But you don't remember any hype about DTR coming out the draft just because it was like, yeah, man, he played out there at UCLA. I wonder how much like being in the Big Ten changes that for them. But yeah. Kind of, I think for back... like UCLA especially, it's a huge boost. Like for all those guys, like because USC, you still get you know the, the the logo gets you looked at a little bit, mm -hmm. but everybody else that's been out here, it's like just USC, Oregon, and UW. Like outside of that, nobody really cares. Yeah, and it was crazy too because the Pac-12 was so good last year, but like I think outside of the Caleb Williams games. I don't really think that many people were paying attention. And like USC wasn't even one of the best teams in the Pac-12 no. for the last couple <laughs> yeah. of years. So it, it it was just so interesting to see how this thing ha has changed and how people treat college football based on just where you play it um, can just change so much about where you get drafted overall and how you get looked at for, because also another thing that's important to talk about, where you get drafted kind of dictates how people look at you for the rest of your career, right? Like Sam Donald still out there getting shots um, cause he's a former first round pick, right? James Winston about to get another shot cause he's a former number one overall pick. Baker Mayfield got a ton of shots Mariota. because he was a number one overall. Mariota, like you get drafted that first round and people have any level of belief in you, you will get to play for a long time before people call the book on you being sorry even if you demonstrated that you were sorry, right? Like, well, I think Josh Rosen is the quickest one they got out of, out of there. Yeah, but even then, it's like, he still went to like four or five teams. I remember he went to Arizona, Miami. Mm -hmm. He was with Atlanta during like the end of Matt Ryan's run. Didn't he, did he ever make his way to Cleveland? Yeah, he was in Cleveland for yeah, a training like, camp. He still got shot after shot after shot. Like, it's, it, it's one of those things. But if you end up being a fourth, fifth round pick, you got that one time to make a difference there or else, you know, people going to start losing patience on you really quick. Like, look, with Brock Purdy, it's still happening. Like, he went to a Super Bowl last year, and, like, the moment he puts together four back-to-back -to -back bad games, everybody's like, Cinderella's gun. Like, it's it, because they're just waiting on it. I, you remember, I don't know how, uh, if you remember early Tom Brady stuff, Oh, yeah. But it used to always be on the line for Tom Brady. Like, yeah. I don't think people who are younger understand that people didn't give Tom Brady his credit until like 2014. Yeah, it didn't happen until the second wave of Super Bowls. Of Super Bowls, that, that right? first wave, it's so funny how it's talked about now, man, because you're right. That first wave, it was Tom is just surviving off of this defense. This is such an average quarterback. Like, this guy is just lucky he fell into the, the right situation mm -hmm. with Bill. And then it all flipped, like you said, like 2014 and everything like that. But Tom actually... Like, if you go Got back better. and look, it's like, yeah, it makes sense because he was a lot better at that point. Like, he really was just kind of like a really high-end game manager to start. So, I don't know. Yeah, it I mean, he progressed throughout all of that time. And what playing well and being on a good team allowed him to do yeah. was develop, which 
I'll get to this point at the end because I think we're going to veer off too far from the Jameis Winston path that we're supposed to be on here. But winning matters because it it gives you the leeway to develop these guys long term. You start losing, you can't develop anybody. You can't keep anything stable there. And with Tom, that was a key part in his development. But yeah, a lot of people don't understand. Like even those years where he was cooking and wasn't winning a championship between what, 06 and 2014? Right, that's yeah. six, seven years where he won some MVPs. You know, people were wondering, like, can he get over the hump by himself? Right. Yeah. It, it's just it's funny how these narratives change over time, and, and truly the victors get the right to history here because it's definitely not the people who just like watched it happen straight up. Uh, yeah. Because the way I hear people talk about early Tom Brady, I'm like, dog, you lived through it. Why are you trying to tell me that he was a franchise quarterback in 03? Like, <laughs> like nobody thought that. Everybody thought this dude was a game manager in the creation of Bill Belichick to like 2014. And really, until he won that championship with Tampa Bay. Yeah. The reason I want to bring you on here, you have, by virtue of being somebody who covers the Atlanta Falcons, have had an eye on what goes on with the Saints, because y'all hate the Saints <laughs> out there. And I wanted to talk to somebody who was familiar with not just Jameis Winston, but like that version of Jameis Winston specifically, because I feel like when I watch him in Tampa Bay and then what he was doing in, in New Orleans, there's obviously some similarities because Jameis is Jameis, but there are some differences there. Uh, from your experience watching Jameis and knowing the kind of environment around it, what kind of background can you give us about Jameis um, in his time in New Orleans that could be missed when it comes to just looking at the stats or going through like the, the PFF charts? Yeah, you know, I think um, I, I think you saw a more mature Jameis in New Orleans uh, he was much more dedicated to running the offense and the system the way that Sean Payton had kind of wanted it to be done. Uh, I think what really got him in trouble a lot of times in Tampa is that you really just saw him take so many risks because of, you know, the arm talent that he has. And he, he still has that arm talent, but you can tell that they made an effort to really try to reel him in and just try to get him more focused on, you know, doing what's asked of him. And if it doesn't work out, then it doesn't work out. They don't need him to play hero ball. And he did a really good job in 2021 when he filled in. I thought he was able to really, you know, manage everything quite well for the offense. It was still the Sean Payton offense. You know, you've got outbreaking routes from the slot. you got in-breaking routes from the outside. And they love to attack the seams. And Jameis has the ability to make pretty much any throw that, you know, an offensive coordinator asks of him. And you didn't really see any drop in physical ability. I think the only area of his game that didn't take the next step was his penchant for taking sacks. A mm -hmm. lot of people focus on the interceptions when it comes to Jameis, but I think what kind of gets lost in a lot of that is he he did have the tendency to just kind of hold the ball if he wasn't mm. going to throw an interception, and they couldn't kind of get into that middle zone of him just throwing an incompletion. So, you know, you, you did see a slightly more mature Jameis while he was with New Orleans. It's interesting when you have to talk about Jameis Winston because he's been around so long as kind of this folk character um, that people forget that at one point in time, Jameis Winston was seen as like the heir apparent to Andrew Luck when it comes to draft hype. <laughs> like the, he was what he, 2013 was his freshman year at Florida State. Because yeah. he won the last BCS national championship and then went on to play in the first college football playoff without losing a game in between. He came close at that second season <laughs> at yeah. Florida State, but went there, did that. And like, this is a hard thing that I have. I have a thing I have a hard time explaining to the audience sometimes is that. There is the Jameis Winston that you see with the memes, but there's also the Jameis Winston that like made evaluators super excited about him, right? He always has had this arm talent, this next level confidence in his arm talent, which is not wavered despite varying levels of success throughout his career, which is almost incredible to think about. Yeah. Um, and, and then like there is this element like Jameis Winston coming out of college was seen as a football savant. 
And like that's still part of his game. Sometimes he makes these decisions and they look crazy, but then you look at what he's trying to do and you're like, "Ah, oh, that's crazy that he got there, but it makes sense that he's trying to do it. It's just like, can he execute it on, on, on a regular basis it is the bigger question with Jameis. Like just looking at him from the perspective of a guy who was that big of a prospect we also forget how big of a prospect marcus mariota was yeah. at the time remember they compared desmond ritter to him i'm like oh we have lost the oh, plot man. because like <laughs> because like marcus lost mariota plot, was it plot, was seen as season, it was a because like they were comparative to marcus mariota. like do we not for did we forget that marcus mariota was seen as somebody you tank for this like one of the most accurate quarterbacks in college football that year too and like we're, yeah. we're, we're tagging desmond ritter with that hilarious that that was Marcus Mariota too like the most accurate quarterback in college football that year hey man sometimes these college football stats don't mean nothing okay <laughs> like like oh I just remembered that oh uh, because I've seen some of Marcus's tape but <laughs> it's crazy to think about but I, when you look at Jameis from that perspective of a guy who was a no doubt number one overall pick in a quarterback well what we thought at the time was a quarterback heavy draft. How does he get to this point? And like, do you think a Geno Smith type reconstruction of him is possible? Or is he just too fervently Jameis for all of that to happen? Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't know if a Geno Smith type resurrection could happen, but I think you could get like high level Jacoby Brissett. Uh, and obviously not not Jacoby like we're seeing now, but Jacoby a few years ago. And I know that some people either like or don't like that. But when you look at the landscape of backup quarterbacks, mm -hmm. the quarterback play in the league right now, obviously everybody knows is, is down. Uh, Jameis is one of the better options in terms of backups, like just based off of his resume alone. Uh, I, I don't know how many other guys you're going to find that have, you know, thrown 30 touchdown passes in a single season. So I think that's kind of what has helped Jameis, you know, maintain his status as a professional football player is he does have a decent resume. He has a resume that obviously has, you know, taken him out for being considered a starter year over year, but teams still see value in his play. And I do think that his ability to show that he can operate as the backup quarterback in New Orleans then extended his career and got him to this point. Um, mm -hmm. I'm a big Stefanski fan. I know that that's not really cool in 2024. It was pretty cool for the last couple of years. And I just don't believe that Kevin can't get him ready or can't put a game plan in place that Jameis can execute. So you know, when you ask if there's any kind of resurrection that could take place here or anything like that, I do think that there is a chance that Jameis can come in and kind of give you a little bit of that 2021 gameplay that we saw when he came in for the Saints and had to be the starter for them to start the year. Um, mm -hmm. How long and how consistent he can be maintaining it, that's obviously going to be the question. You know, it's ironic here because I didn't even know you were going to compare him to Jacoby Brissett, but... I made the similar comp earlier today on a different show where I was like, Jameis Winston is like, what if Jacoby Reset was a little bit more talented and had more confidence? Yeah. Like that is basically what Jameis does. Same type of sneaky athleticism, right? Like I think it's a little bit different. Jacoby Brissett has amazing feet, but he's not fast, right? He's like a not four nine guy. Jameis Winston, he doesn't have great feet. Um, or at least it never looks like he has great feet because he just there's something about how he moves that makes him look unintentional. Like like Michael Jordan never looked like he did anything unintentionally, right? Yeah. Jameis always looks unintentional whenever he's being athletic. Um, and like if he doesn't look like he's doing something unintentionally, it's like, whoa, what the fuck happened there with Jameis, right? Uh, Cause there was like a moment in this game where like he climbed the pocket, rolled out. I was like, wow, he looked like a good athlete there, but I've watched enough Jameis to know that's not all like the Jameis. I, I think about is like, remember the Rose bowl, his last year in college and he had that crazy fumble. Right? <laughs> and it turned Turn into like a meme. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, that's the athleticism of Jameis. Like it'll catch yeah. you off guard if you don't plan for it because he can run. 
Um, and he does have the confidence in his legs to do it. But yeah, I also think, you know, Jameis, he's been somebody who's played a lot of under center football um, yeah. in his career. And you go back to Tampa Bay, even back at Florida State with Jimbo Fisher. He's done this. He's a play action guy. Um, you look at his overall numbers with play action, his career, what, 64% passing, 5,212 yards, what, um, 36 touchdowns, 15 interceptions, a overall 80.2 pro football focus grade, um, and what, 272 first downs. So it's 48.9% first down percentage per pass attempt in play action. He's always been a solid guy there. The Browns probably at their best when they're running heavy play action. Now they got Nick Chubb back. Like he's the kind of guy that you say all the things that you want a Stefanski quarterback to have, which is good run game, be good off play action, and take a chunk of the intermediate part of the field. Now that's been the Browns' biggest part of their issue. Um, and I want you to kind of elaborate on this once I get this one out here. The Browns have not taken advantage of the intermediate part of the field. Now, you can imagine when you're running a system, even like Ken Dorsey's or Kevin Stefanski's, whoever you're running, these are both guys who like to high load you, right? Like to attack that intermediate part of the field. You want to hear a fun stat? Jameis Winston played in one drive in this game. Deshaun Watson played a whole half before he tore his Achilles, and DTR played in the second half. Jameis Winston tripled them in intermediate pass attempts and led the team in intermediate pass completions also had the lowest time to throw on it deshaun watson was sitting at 4.4 seconds time to throw on intermediate passes which is telling you exactly what's happening he's not throwing intermediate in structure right dtr was at 3.10 james was at 2.76 which is like he's the only one out there that was willing to throw intermediate in structure yeah. Is this a consistent trend with Jameis where he's like, no, he's always going to try and get the bigger chunk? Is that part of his interception problem too? And also a deeper question about that that we could roll into. If that's the case where most of his interceptions come from, is that really as big as a deal as we make it out to be? Because to me, I feel like the interceptions that you throw that are on the check downs, those are the ones that end up being a lot more dangerous. Mm. Yeah, you know, like I said, when I started this off in New Orleans, we really did see a more mature Jameis. And, you know, I am of the mindset that a lot of his interceptions, especially, you know, like when we look at Tampa, just came from him playing hero ball. Um, he did have Mike Evans and he had a couple of pieces. But for the most part, those Tampa teams were pretty dire. You know, it's, it, <laughs> it, it was a lot of, you know, Jameis, we really need you to go out there and, and kind of win this for us. They had Dirk Cutter calling plays for him which was a very antiquated uh vertical style passing offense that didn't really operate over the middle of the field and really just asked him to throw seam routes didn't really ask him to throw digs or anything like that so when he got to new orleans it was a big change for him because that is a lot of what new orleans and sean payton like to do they like to attack the middle they do more than just seems they throw those digs they have receivers running there you know michael thomas feasted from running in breaking routes from the outside um and so when i think about what Jameis is going to be able to do for stefanski and the browns offense i do believe that he's going to be able to operate uh and succeed in that environment because it's one that's not asking him to be the driver of the offense consistently um we you know the falcons have zach robinson as their offensive coordinator in the middle of the field is you know they have the same philosophy that's where they want the ball to go they want to be able to move it through that area and we weren't able to do that the past couple of years they brought in kirk and kirk's been able to execute that and i do feel that Jameis is going to be able to be in a similar environment that has a decent supporting cast that's going to let him play in structure. And it's been a focus for Jameis to play in structure. Like when you told me those time to throw numbers just now, the biggest thing that popped into my mind was he's not waiting. He's see, he's, he's obviously playing within the structure of the offense. And if the man is open, if he's, if he's there on his read, he's hitting it. He's not holding on to it anymore. He's not going to look and keep trying to make the next play. Jameis is just focused on delivering that ball and doing his job. And if Stefanski has gotten that instilled in him the same way that Peyton had done a pretty good job of it, then 
I do think that it is going to be a good fit for this offense and that he's going to be able to do what you guys need him to do. Now, you mentioned one thing about Jameis and his propensity to kind of take sacks at times. That's been a huge thorn in the side with Deshaun. Now, when you say that, is that is Jameis – because there's two types of ways you can do that, right? There's holding on to the ball a little bit longer than you need to, and I don't know what's going on, but my screen's just going to be frozen for now. Uh, but there's holding on to the ball much longer than you need to, and then there is – running or blowing angles for your tackles that create pressures, right? I think with Deshaun at times, and even with DTR, young player, you're going to get a lot of that rollout, kind of like blow your tackles angles and create a lot of sacks and pressures that way. Is that the case with Jameis? Is he more savvy with navigating the pocket? Or is this something that you have to worry about with him if he kind of gets in a hero ball mood? So... I don't even necessarily think it's a hero ball issue, but it kind of goes back to what we were talking about, where sometimes it just looks like what Jameis is doing isn't always necessarily intentional. And mm. he has moments where he's able to navigate the pocket really well. And then he has moments where he just kind of runs into his own offensive lineman. And, you know, you're like, all right, what what happened there? Um, I, I think it's a pretty, you know, basically, Based on his time in New Orleans, I thought it was a pretty, you know, fair mix of holding on to the ball, trying to make a play and just kind of, you know, a little bit of self-inflicted wounds. The Saints offensive line uh, past 2021, when you look at when Jameis had to do spot duty in the following years, it was kind of a patchwork scenario. You know, it wasn't really the best offensive line and uh, he wasn't always given time either. And so I think 2021, you saw him with a much better line that was healthier and he was able to operate well. In 2022, when the pressure gets there and and when you when it starts to get there consistently, I think it can get to Jameis and it, it starts making him maybe, you know, force the ball a little too quickly. But I'm not too concerned with his, you know, sack taking as like if we were coming fresh out of his Tampa tenure. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's something that he's definitely like, you know, especially with his age, you know, at this point, James is getting up there. He, he does not want to take sacks and hits anymore. I think he will take them. He'll stand in the pocket, but I think he's going to, you know, manage that a little bit better and that he's worked on it, you know, as well. Now, this is also an interesting part of this conversation. Because this is the this is the situation the Browns kind of put themselves in by doubling down on Watson the last few weeks. Unfortunately, Watson gets the Achilles tear, kind of forces their hand. From the outside looking in, somebody who is not invested in the Browns season or not a Browns fan, how would you receive if the Browns offense start suddenly like became within the top ten or fifteen in the second half of the season um, with Jameis Winston at quarterback? Would you receive that as, wow, Kevin's doing a really good job? Or would you receive that as, boy, it really hurt the team there. <laughs> like, not making a check. Like, how do you think that gets received? And, like, how would you guess ownership would, would handle that if, you know, because it's kind of one of those situations where, like, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Yeah. Yeah, you know, man. It feels like I'm in a unique position because like we were the it, it was it was us until it was y'all, you know, it was Falcons <laughs> until it was the Browns in terms of winning the Deshaun Watson sweepstakes. So uh, <laughs> looking at it from have you ever angle, thought about that? Like, what if the Browns didn't send a counter offer? Like I've thought about I, I've definitely thought about it. Um I don't know if we would we we wouldn't be in a drastically different situation. Like obviously this year would be different, but the past two, like I don't know. But um, I don't really because I also wonder like he was gonna get an extension. It seems like from from whoever he signed with, mm -hmm. it does appear that the extension that Cleveland offered was above and beyond what he was getting offered at the time. So I just wonder what that extension would look like and how that completely changes how the trade is viewed. Yeah. I think it was a difference of like, I mean, there's been so many numbers thrown around, but like, you know, I keep hearing between 30 and 50, like, is like mm -hmm. how, you know, the, was the money difference? Like, which at is, the time? 
which is the difference between like one or two guaranteed years, right? Something like on like the that. contract. So it would be interesting to see like what would this situation be like if the Browns had a clear out of yeah. the contract that wasn't as messy. I mean, they have an out, right? Like, but they they had a clear out that wasn't as messy or at least as visually messy to those who don't understand the salary cap um, in, in this year, this contract versus like a different one. But that that's a whole nother. Look, the Deshaun Watson trade is going to be its own 30 for 30. I've already. It, oh, so, yeah. It's going to be it's a gonna be. multi-part. Um, but, but to answer your original question, I, I think – it's very hard to deduce is Kevin Stefanski still mm. playing or was he still playing to shine because Barry and Haslam were like, Hey, that's where the money is. We don't care. You, you got to figure out how to make this work. So, you know, if Jameis does come out and performs well, I think that's kind of a good thing. Like in terms of like the outlook for Cleveland, because it's like, Hey man, it's clearly not the coach. Like, you know, we've we've seen Stefanski win Coach of the Year multiple times. He's made it work with Flacco. He's made it work with other guys that have come in for quick spurts. And if he's able to do it once again with Jameis, it's really hard for I think anybody to kind of look around and and not just kind of you know just admit that Watson is you know unfortunately cooked and that it just didn't work out in terms of an investment. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know how ownership will receive it i don't know how anybody else would look at it but to me that's just kind of what it would signal is that like is uh, the move just didn't work out and i think there has to be a little bit of that from the browns brass in that hey man like this happens like players fall off randomly like deals go bad like it is what it is you just kind of have to chalk it up at this point um and there's not really much else you can do about it. But luckily, that guy that has won coach of the year is still a good coach. And you can still kind of get this thing moving in the right direction, even if you are anchored down by that contract a little bit. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how it goes, man. Appreciate you coming on to talk about this. Give us some insight about uh, the NFC South. Where can they check you out, man? Yeah, I'm over at the SB Nation outlet, uh, the Falcoholic over there writing and uh, doing a little potting as well. Uh, just talk, talking about Kirk Tober and, and the potential resurgence of Atlanta. I don't, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they, they scrape up nine wins instead of seven this year. And I would love to watch them get their teeth kicked in in the wild card or something because it's just been pretty brutal. But y'all, y'all check me out. You know that's not how out. Atlanta going to lose. Atlanta is not going to give you the luxury of getting blown out. Atlanta will win. Atlanta will go up thirty five and six then with the clock let somebody out. walk them back. <laughs> and it's going to be somebody you can't stand that walks them back too. Like who would be the worst quarterback to get walked down from? Where you're like, man, ain't no uh, way. Like, Derek Carr ain't going to play. Like, yeah. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> hey, you let Spencer Rattler walk you down or something like that. It's like, man, I know this dude ain't walking me down. Speaking of quarterbacks, because I did want to want to sneak this okay. one in here. Is somebody getting more set up to be robbed of an MVP right now than Lamar Jackson? Because th there's no shot that he's not the MVP right now. Like, there's no good argument. Yeah that he's not the MVP that has anything to do with the way that the MVP is usually awarded. But the only argument is the one that tends to be successful in moments like this, which is he ain't done nothing in the playoffs. So you can't give him a, a three-time MVP. It doesn't make it. Yeah, man, like you can't. That's not how the award works. This isn't the first three-time MVP either. It's like, I'm like, yeah. like, you know, Brett Favre was perked out when in his three MVPs. And so it's like, hey, man. The best guy is the best guy. This, this, you, you, can't, you can't hate the player just because you don't see what you want to see in the playoffs. But the playoff record thing always cracks me up because it's such an easy record to flip in like mm -hmm. a couple of years or something or like, or, you know, in a matter of time. It's kind of like when people freak out about like what your record is on Monday Night Football. And it's like, cause I remember Kirk Cousins had an egregiously bad record on it. And then like the last five years, he's just like won those games by happenstance. He's like one in and six kind of before the last five years. Or he it was like, yeah. at one point, it was, I think it's even worse than that. I think it was like. And the stat lines were awful. Nasty. And then now, you know, I got. Now it's prime time. Here. 
You're telling me that Kirk Cousins is one of the most clutch quarterbacks in NFL history, um, which like he's much more clutch than he gets credit for, at least in the regular season, um, especially. It's just that's just not the Kirk Cousins we be talking about sometimes, right? We talk yeah. about the dude who threw a check down on four for twenty five, right? That that that's the dude you be worried about uh, showing up. But yeah, Lamar Jackson, it's like it seems unstoppable that he's going to get MVP this year, and it's just amazing yeah. that he might do this two years in a row with Todd Monken, and Todd Monken like had numerous. Wasn't he at uh? Tampa Bay with Jameis, and then God, he came God to Cleveland after Bay that. At one point, and um, then he was at UGA. Uh, he's at Georgia oh, yeah. before going to the Ravens. Uh, and and shout out to Todd, Oklahoma State offensive coordinator as well. Back in the day, he really helped kick off that whole university uh, explosive offense. I think he was uh, Brandon Whedon and uh, Justin Blackman's OC. So. Those were some Ooh. good days. I, I love Todd, man. I, I'm happy that he's like actually killing it and got another shot in the league. I remember rooting for uh, Oklahoma State at that time period because they had the cool uniforms. They were like, the, 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 look, so we about to, I'm, about to exp- I'm about to expose how old I am. You know, back in the day, they didn't used to have all these uniform combinations, right? Like, they, they, they were the first team out there with like, they had the white helmets, the mm-hmm. matte black helmets with the osu on the side of them they had the gray joints the orange ones like they were kind of like oregon but like somehow is still water oklahoma (laughs) man that oil money (laughs) yeah and it was like they had uh just the black man brandon we did at that time was a fun story until the browns drafted him um gilbert Justin Gilbert. Oh goodness <laughs> gracious! Yeah, man, it went. Yeah, I know. Bad. I was like, I gotta. The Browns gotta stop taking my boys. It's not. It's not a good look for either of us. Right I remember now. that year on Road to Glory. I had uh, made Barry Sanders Jr. You remember that? Barry yeah, Sanders yeah. Jr. went to Stanford, and I think he Backed came back to McCaffrey, Oklahoma State, and then he transferred over to Oklahoma State to finish up. Uh, I, I thought Barry Sanders. I don't think Jr. people remember this. I was at Bob. Oklahoma State when we had Tyreek Hill. I don't even know if people remember Tyreek Hill played at he Oklahoma ran, State. He it's, was he was a running back, right? He was a receiver slash running back slash like he did everything. It honestly one of the most impressive individual seasons I've ever seen from somebody. Uh, just oh wow. yeah, y'all had uh y'all had Mason Mason Rudolph. That's, that's Oklahoma State as well. It was Mason's rookie year, and he did he played two games with Tyreek. They went two and zero in those games, and they beat Oklahoma. And everybody yelled at Gundy because they could have been playing Rudolph his rookie year. Uh, or his fresh his whole freshman year, but just just waited it out. Yeah, Oklahoma State's definitely one of the more. Are you guys going to continue that? The oh, y'all got how y'all going to continue the Oklahoma State Oklahoma thing? Is that just done now? Oh, you didn't want to schedule anymore. Wow, that's nuts. That is Al, crazy. Alan, Alan Alan Bowman gave him too much last year. I guess I don't know. <laughs> that's crazy. I guess I guess that's what made that last win kind of a. Uh, really tasty for Oklahoma State fans. Yeah. But yeah, it's a it, it's always been interesting just this era of football uh, that we have existed under, right? The Mike Gundy, I'm a man, I'm 40. Like, like, like he's still there. Like, man. It's it, it is the Gainesville this offseason. I don't know. I don't, I don't know how much longer he's got. But it, it is it has been a interesting time here. Um, you you got any thoughts about this draft class at quarterback? Oh, Are you no. sold on Shador yet? Oh yeah, I think uh, I think it's a one QB draft. I think it's like Leash. I think it's like one or two. I I it, I'm taking Sanders. Like if I'm mm. any of these any of these my teams only, that are able to, I like. My yeah, my man, I don't know Carson Beck. I'm like I don't know what happened. I don't like. It feels like a Hackenberg situation. Um, Alar, Musselberger, all these other names. Man, I'm just like, I just, it just does. None of them are hitting. None of them really look. I, I am actually it, a lot happier with the Michael Penix pick at this point. <laughs> Much happier than but, I was in April. It reminds me. The only thing that worries me about Shador is I know how fast a good athlete looks like in the Big Twelve. Like I remember watching Baker Mayfield run in the Big Twelve. <laughs> And he looked like he was a dual threat. Like he was, he was doing read option keepers at Oklahoma. Like, and Baker Mayfield ran like four eight. And that's no disrespect to the Big Twelve. It's just college is different. 
And like, you know, the Big 12, they don't have Oklahoma, they don't have Texas. So like it's, it's reconstructing its identity again. And I'll be watching Shador out there. I'll be like, man, he don't look fast. And it's the Big 12. And I'm, I, every time I watch Baker Mayfield, I am reminded of just how different the NFL is. Because in, in Bryce Young too, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> every time they try to escape, it ends horribly for both yeah. of them. I think and Baker I'm just gets reminded too. <laughs> like, oh my goodness! Because every time Baker tries to run hits, out, man. <laughs> yeah, he just gets smacked. I'm just like, oh man, he used to do that in college, like so easily. Yeah. You were like, we were like, he's got good feet, athletic ability, and then you go, and I'm just looking at Shadow. I'm like, well, he plays a style where he could not be out here trying to roll out in the NFL. They going the, the defensive tackle going to run him down because he does not look very fast, and that is my v- biggest concern. Like he has these habits that I people have convinced themselves are just there because Dion didn't do a good job building that offensive line out there at Colorado, and I agree with that to a point, but I'm like. He's learned to get out of some of these bad habits. I mean, these uh, the, these pressure situations in probably the worst way he could have learned it mm. because he's rolling out a lot. And he's one, he doesn't have the instincts to do it well. Two, he's not yeah. the athlete to do it well. And like, I think a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, he's a Sanders kid. So he's going to be a great athlete. But I'm like, I watched that kid from Jackson State to his second year in Colorado. And I remember every time I've seen him, I've been very underwhelmed with how athletic he is not, right? And he's only gotten slower because he's picked up weight to get more durable. So that's my thing. And like, it's tough being that slow when you big. He's not necessarily a giant player either. And I know some people are like, some people have tried to convince me he runs four six, but I'm like, I know what four six looks like. Oh, no, I don't know about that. All that, all that matters for him is like getting yeah. his footwork right. Like, yeah. I think if he can like, do that, then can he'll, be, he... he'll be solid. But I agree with you. I think, I think also people are seeing like the Caleb Williams success now and they're mm-hmm. remembering his out of structure stuff. But what Caleb never got credit for, like at USC or his Oklahoma days, was he excelled within structure as well. Mm-hmm. And like, you just don't see shooter like getting as many of those opportunities. Cause like you said, the O line's like, eh, but he's just kind of bailing out of a lot of pockets too, at this point, because he's just more comfortable. Yeah. It's, 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 it's interesting to look at him because I'm like, sometimes I see him and he fights to stay in structure almost like too long. Where I'm like, just yeah. The ball. Uh, but other times he gets out there, he does stuff. I'm like, it looks great in college, but I'm like, man, you just ain't gonna get that chance to make that throw in the NFL, man. Like it's it's just not that much time. And you ain't yeah. the kind of athlete that's gonna buy that amount of time. Like, think about what Kyler Murray used to look like out there, and it's like Kyler Murray looks fast in the NFL. He don't yeah. look that fast. <laughs> like he don't look like he's zipping around out there like he did in the Big 12, or even just in college in general, right? Like at Texas AM. It's just that speed difference. I think a lot of people underestimate it. And it's like, you got to look at how somebody plays. And I, that's my thing with Bryce Young. I'm like, when I watch him play, I'm like, this is a bad idea because he plays like Deshaun Watson. He plays like Joe Burrow, but he's half the size and not that same athlete. Yeah. And that is a recipe for disaster. And like with the, with uh, Shador, that's the only thing I need to see him play. I need him to get to the Big 12 championship game. So I might have to sacrifice Oklahoma State here. Um, oh, brother, so, they're out. Yeah, Don't you worry yeah, about them yeah, being sacrificed. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're going to have to they're, – they're, Oklahoma State can't do that thing where they just beat somebody random at the end of the year, right, like yeah. they usually do. Bro, like, nah, they need to drop that game at the end of the year to, to Colorado so we can see what he looks like versus BYU. Hopefully they can win that game so I can see him against, like, a playoff team. Be nice to see him against like, some, some other talent. Because it might just be a thing where, like, once he plays better talent, he he's like, all right, I'm going to just hitch up in the pocket now. Like, I can't do that. Like, he gets hit a couple of times, mm-hmm. and then he realizes he can't do that shit. Right? Like, some players just need that. Like, as long as you can roll out, you're going to do it against the competition that you have. But you get hit in the face a couple of times. It's like, oh, yeah, can't do that no more. Okay, definitely going to change that. Like, you saw that with C.J. Stroud, like, in the NFL. Yeah, like, nope, that's a good one. can't do that anymore. Okay, I'm going to just do this thing that I'm really good at. So... That, that's that's what I really need to see out of Shador for the rest of the season. It's going to be interesting to see if he gets to a point where he can see that. Um, 
But yeah, I think this draft class is fascinating. The Brown situation is fascinating. Jameis Winston is fascinating. Hopefully you guys had an interesting uh, 40 plus minutes of, of listening to with this conversation about football. Trey, appreciate you coming on, yapping about some ball with me, man. Uh, make sure you check him out at the Falcoholic. Make sure you follow him on Twitter. How, how do you spell it? Because you spell it differently, right? It's like a three in there somewhere, right? Trey three, Sean. <laughs> yes, the Simpsons avatar still. Yeah, so it's pretty much almost like a perfect carbon copy of what you're getting right now, though. So you know, <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> make sure you yellow. Yeah. Well, you know, you you did it before AI was out here doing those pictures. So you know, that's you right. That that's self made right there, self made. But appreciate you coming on um and, and talking about Jameis and many other things. Make sure you guys go check them out. Everybody have a great day. Have a better night. Peace.